<laughs> yeah. Well, well, thank you very much, and uh, I will uh, I will talk a bit about the the brain research that went into the book, The Master and His Emissary. But I'm going to begin um, by talking about logic and, and myth. And also because no good lecture at this event can start or can, or can go on without a picture of a coral reef. Um, there is a coral reef here. Um, and uh, um, I don't think this thing is working, actually. But uh, that won't be anything. Oh, it is. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, I wanted to pick up on, I don't know if many of you were at Richard uh, Forty's talk yesterday, um, the idea of abundance and diversity as a primary aim of evolution, if one can talk teleologically. In other words, it, things progress not just motored by utility, but it seems by um, a need for multiplicity and diversity. And uh, I also feel very strongly in the nature of things about the human being, that we're not just motivated, in fact, by utility. Um, the idea that uh, all the beautiful things in the world, that our spiritual aspirations, can really be reduced to something about sexual selection, um, I, I think is far-fetched and actually rather irrational. Um, and I think it leaves very much out of the story. But anyway, there we go. I'm here to talk to you about the myth of logic and the logic of myth. And for those of you who want to hear me debunk logic, I'm, I'm going to disappoint you because I have a huge respect for it and depend on it very much. But I, I want to point out that just as there is nothing um, uh, false about myth because it is myth, it can be the p most potent route to truth, um, logic has its mythology too, and it isn't by any means infallible. Um, so I'm going to start... Um, talking about the, 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 the problems of logic. And um, I was reminded of my dad, actually, when I was starting this out. My dad was a, a very good doctor, but he, he wasn't very good at understanding opera. And um, one day I was watching the television, and there was a relay from Glyndebourne, which is a place in England where they do opera. And it was of Mozart's Don Giovanni. And I was about 17 or something, and I was watching this. and. Um, it was just near the start of the opera. Only three minutes into the opera, the commendatore is killed by Don Giovanni. And it's one of the most moving scenes in all of Mozart. And the Don is lying there on these steps, clutching his breast, because he's just been run through with a sword. And he's going, ah, socorso. And the strings are throbbing away underneath. And my dad comes in, he says, what's this? It's an opera. What opera? It, 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 Don Giovanni by Mozart. Well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> What's ridiculous? Well, he's just sustained a pneumothorax. I mean, nobody can sing when they sustain a pneumothorax. <laughs> um, and, uh, <coughs> okay, uh, he was a little literal minded, I suppose. And um, I came across this wonderful quote from William Cobbett, who was an English uh, journalist. Um, social reformer and farmer in the uh, 19th century. And he wrote, uh, have you heard of John Milton and Paradise Lost? It's one of the great works of English literature. Anyway, he wrote, the whole of Milton's poem is such barbarous trash, so outrageously offensive to reason and to common sense, that one is naturally led to wonder how it can have been tolerated by a people whom astronomy, navigation, and chemistry are understood. Um, this man also, by the way, criticised William Wilberforce, the great slave reformer, um, for being on the side of fat, lazy, laughing and singing Negroes. Um, he wasn't altogether right in his outlook on life. And I'm also reminded of the late Mr. Hitler, who said that he never, never read novels because that kind of reading annoyed him. So uh, being, being a, um, uh, averse to mythology and keen on the sciences and logic doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you see most of the picture. Um, uh, as I say, I'm here only actually to uh, 
limit the errors of logic. It's a very, very useful tool. Um, and uh, I, I, the Greeks had two, uh, two, two ideas about truth. One was called logos, which was what you found by the process of reasoning. And the other was mythos, what you understood out of the experience of life and at a level that might be hard to make explicit. And it's really, in a way, a category mistake, as philosophers would say, to examine one in terms of the other. It would be like taking King Lear for a literal account of the reign of a particular royal personage who quite probably never existed. So everything has its mythology, and like everything, logic has its mythology. And what is that? It runs ahead of what logic itself would support. It really says that the only source of truth for an intelligent, educated person would be the, the, the process of, of logic. And I just want to say I think we should be wary of this and uh, approach it as we should approach all things, including myths, with appropriate scepticism. I suppose the first thing to say is that logic can't found itself. So uh, it has to start from something which it can't reason about. These are called axioms. So they're things that it has taken to be true. They might not be true, actually, and the only way in which we can say that we, we think they're true is that they normally accord with experience. Well, normally according with experience is an important way of getting to the truth. But it's not really the same as logic. It's more like intuition, which comes from experience. Equally, it can't really tell us much about the fruits of logic. A logical process ends up with something else, but it can't really tell us very much about it or about its nature, its quality, or why we should value it. That, again, comes from human experience. So what is it? It seems to be a sort of intermediary, which will take us by a process of uh, a, a sort of self-referring nature, give me some premises, and according to an internal system, I can unpack that, and we can reach somewhere else. That is a very useful thing to do. But it can't either ground it at the bottom end, or, uh, and say, well, this is definitely true where I start, or what the truth is about where I end up. It is a consistency machine. Actually, we can't also rely on logic to explain why we should use logic. You can't reason to logic using logic. We have an intuition from experience that logic is often very helpful. So it's wrapped up in at the bottom, the top, and in the middle with intuition. And if that isn't bad enough, let us consider the facts with which we reason. Facts, of course, are facts and therefore unquestionable. Or are they? First of all, the facts from which we reason depend on how we attend to them. In fact, how we attend to something changes what we see there, and therefore what facts we assume to be the case. Equally, a lot of the facts don't agree with one another, so you can find pieces of scientific research that will suggest things that are clearly opposed to one another. That's the norm in science. And of course, there is a process over time whereby we, we sort of weed things out. But generally speaking, we're relying on whether they make sense at a higher level. And that is really seeing the overall picture. It's understanding the gestalt, if you like. Uh, pieces of data that are wild, they're worth paying attention to because they might upset everything and turn us onto a new paradigm. That's true. But if they don't get replicated or there's nothing else that suggests this, then we tend to sort of phase them out. So we harden our view up in, in a sort of experiential, intuitive way uh, around those facts. And of course, um, sad to say, a lot of the stuff that is produced as science is much less reliable than the mythology of science would say it was. Uh, there's plenty of scientific evidence that actually journals rely more on uh, things like the prestige of the authors, um, uh, readers and so forth can be fallible, and so on and so forth. And some of the research is actually fudged. 
and indeed even when it's not fudged, uh, it turns out that scientists like philosophers often begin with their conclusions and reason back rather than start with evidence and reason forward to conclusions. That's not because they're bad people, it's because they're people. And being a scientist doesn't stop you from being a person. So I'm not here to cast aspersions on science or logic. Let me please reiterate that. I have spent 20 years reasoning on the basis of science, and I would be undermining my own work if I said that. But I do think it's appropriate to think of the limits of rationality. Because nowadays there are people like... Uh, our friend Dawkins, who gets wheeled out rather often in these lectures, who seems to have a very narrow conception of knowledge, of humanity, of what the world might be. The trouble is, lots of people are terribly good at, for example, microbiology, or they're awfully good at astronomy, and somehow that leads them to believe they will be good philosophers and theologians, and they fill the newspapers with their views on these subjects, never having bothered to take a look at philosophy. There we go. <laughs> See, one of the problems with reason, as the philosopher Stanley Fish pointed out, is that it doesn't know what it is it doesn't know. Because it is a self-enclosed system, it's not necessarily aware of the things that don't fit. After all, if they don't fit, it simply ignores them because they don't fit into the system. Fortunately, I don't just have to say that here, standing before you as a rather um, uh, middle-ranking kind of uh, scientist and mathematician, um, I can call on the greatest names that ever lived in this realm. For example, Pascal, one of the unimpeachably great philosophers and mathematicians, said that reason is indeed poor if it doesn't understand how limited reason itself is. And um, the philosopher and mathematician, and indeed logician, uh, C.S. Peirce, the American 19th century philosopher, said, it is the instincts, the sentiments, that make the substance of the soul, cognition is only its surface, its locus of contact with what is external to it. And he also said, and these both come from an essay called, rather charmingly, Detached Ideas on Vitally Important Topics, man is endowed with a form of emotional rationality, he has the ability to cognize from his disposition to feel what is valuable seems to be immediately felt and cognized. Now, in this setting, we haven't got time to unpack all of that. It's absolutely fascinating stuff. It reminds me of the philosophy of Max Scheler, um, which, again, I can only advert to today. Um, the contemporary of Heidegger's, who unfortunately died young, and who, according to Heidegger, was the only man who understood him, Heidegger. Uh, and he gave at uh, Scheler's funeral, the funeral oration, in which he said he was the greatest, Scheler was the greatest philosopher of his generation. But Scheler thought that, in fact, the value of something is not something you reason to, it's something you are aware of, as you're aware of the colour blue. It has a sort of realm of its own that can't be just utility, utility or rationality. Uh, and he called this... Uh, in German, Wahrnehmung, we haven't got away in English, probably there is in Dutch, of saying this. Um, and it, it, so uh, it, the, the, the sort of um, concept of value perception uh, uh, being something that you just uh, are able to, to feel. Um, as uh, Antonio Damasio, well-known American neuroscientist, has pointed out, um, and lots of others too, uh, what comes first is feeling. Uh, it's not so much cogito ergo sum as uh, sentio ergo sum. I feel, therefore I am. And in uh, biology this is called, or in human biology, this is called the primacy of affect. And what it means is that usually our conclusions are based on intuition and a sense of something, and that we later justify them through argument. Uh, yes, uh, uh, of course there's also Gödel, and perhaps no good uh, uh, lecture on philosophy can manage without a reference to Gödel, um, about whom Greg Chaitin, a prominent um, American mathematician, pointed out that it's not just that um, with any... Uh, self-consistent system, there are propositions that are true but cannot be proved by the system, but there are, and I quote from him, an infinite number of true mathematical theorems uh, 
that cannot be proved from any finite system of axioms. So there's a bit of a problem with the idea that logic will get us everywhere. And indeed, being rational can, in, at times, be extremely irrational. I mean, if you think the same kind of thinking that gets you somewhere in court as a defence lawyer um, is appropriate in the bedroom, you're up for a surprise. And uh, it's not just that, but there's a kind of rationality, taking rationality too far, that is clearly irrational. Um, Minkowski, uh, Eugène Minkowski in the 1920s, a great phenomenological psychiatrist, uh, was probably the first person to note that although we think of madness as loss of reason, the madness of schizophrenia is better characterised as an excess of reason or even a displacement of reason, so that we have to reason about things to understand them in a way that most of us would understand intuitively and from common sense. And this often leads to false conclusions. When ideas come to you that you don't recognise, instead of being able to think, it probably came from my unconscious, you um, imagine that uh, the police have set up a radio system in the next room and are beaming ideas through the wall into your brain because this is the logical conclusion. I didn't recognise these thoughts. Where do they come from? And uh, again, you will know from Damasio's um, famous book, Descartes' Error, in which, by the way, he commits Descartes' error throughout, um, that uh, he describes a man who uh, could not uh, any longer, after a right hemisphere stroke, uh, understand things uh, immediately, but had to reason towards a conclusion about everything, and he brought his life to a standstill. Perhaps in a more interesting way, rationality is self-subversive. And if you don't know um, a book, which is now, I'm afraid, probably 30 years old or even longer, more, 35 years old, um, by John Elster, a, a brilliant uh, Norwegian philosopher who speaks English better than most English people. Um, uh, he wrote a book uh, uh, about this topic um, called Sour Grapes, um, Essays in the Subversion of Rationality, in which he pointed out that it's quite irrational uh, to do lots of things that rationally you would think right. For example, um, uh, if you have a goal, the rational thing is to go straight for it, uh, one would have thought, and try and achieve it. But there are many things in life that are paradoxical in this way, starting with something as simple as going to sleep. The harder you try, the less you can manage it. And the more you tell yourself, I'm not going to try, I'm going to um, try not to, um, this subterfuge is seen through by your reason and you simply can't get to sleep. But there are many other rather more important things, like trying to be natural. Um, trying to be sexually aroused, trying to be wise, all rather important things in life, but they're best not done by trying. In fact, what is rational to do tends to be context dependent. For example, one of the problems with the financial crisis was that the algorithm said, uh, if fo the following circumstances happen to be right, you lend. So according to this, uh, it was just the same to lend to Nicaragua as it would be to lend to Germany. Um, but anybody with any common sense or knowledge of the world would know that these are differing uh, sorts of lending with differing consequences. And indeed, unfortunately, Americans, not having a good grasp that there are other cultures than their own, sometimes go into places in the world like the Gulf thinking we know what's right for people because any rational person would like a democracy and they wouldn't particularly want to be ruled by all kinds of old-fashioned laws and rituals. But unfortunately, every context is different. And somewhere that has a different history, a different climate, a, a different geography, a different uh, ethnology, a different theology, uh, and a different philosophy of life is going to uh, say thanks but no thanks sometimes. And uh, that can be mystifying to Americans with good intentions. See, the problem is, if context makes things change, and it does, um, you 
you have a problem with your general rules because none of them are actually applicable. We have to have rules in life in a way, but we have to know how to break them and how to modify them according to general rules. I like very much the saying of Eugene Gendlin, the American philosopher who uh, is the father of a school of uh, psychology called Focusing. Um, he said, and I think this is beautiful, we think more than we can say, we feel more than we can think, we live more than we can feel, and there is much else besides. A couple of rather bright um, uh, French researchers called Mercier and uh, Sperber, uh, well, French and American, I suppose, uh, even produced a paper you may know about a couple of years ago suggesting that reasoning is nothing to do with getting the truth. It's about winning an argument. I mean, this is actually one of the problems with um, having a purely evolutionary approach, is that you don't like ideas like truth. And so you, you think, well, it must have been about um, beating the other guy up. But I do quite like this idea, because it does, it does suggest, it, as, as uh, Mercier says, reasoning doesn't have this functioning of helping us get better beliefs and make better decisions. In fact, uh, you may know that sometimes the more you reflect on a decision, the worse, uh, the worse decision you make, um, and that is uh, psychologically demonstrable. Um, he says it's a purely social phenomenon. It evolves to help us convince others and to be careful when others try to convince us, truth and accuracy being beside the point. Well, I'm not sure I swallow that. Um, I, I do think, of course, that it has, as I keep saying, its place, uh, but it's as well to be sceptical, because it's often used in that way. And as Nietzsche pointed out, it's not always a way that is actually very good at convincing people. He said, beauty speaks to people through art incontrovertibly and produces a greater de degree of agreement than any rationalism ever could. Nothing is less convincing than argument as the experience of every meeting at which there are speeches proves. And... Um, I don't know whether you know, a wonderful book uh, came out a year or so ago by um, a, a chemist called Andy Pross called What is Life? Uh, another book I'll recommend to you. Um, uh, and I just want to quote from him because there is an idea that science has immutable laws and, and uh, works things out theoretically um, to logical conclusions. But actually, of course, what it's doing is making do with a lot of approximations all the time that look good from experience. So this is an exact quote. In contrast to terms such as theories and laws, which radiate some sense of absolute truth, the term pattern is more subtle, less committed, less definitive, more open to modification. Even Newton's laws, those pertaining to gravity and motion, have had to undergo revision following Einstein's revolutionary insights. If we keep in mind that every hypothesis, theory or law is ultimately just a pattern, the day that that theory or law is modified or revoked will be less surprising, less disconcerting. And he goes on to make the point that, generally speaking, what science does is not deductive reasoning, but inductive reasoning, which is really just learning from experience. So, um, uh, 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 and he points out that actually um, the problem in the financial crisis was that instead of learning from experience, people learnt from their theories, which were all very logical, but actually didn't correspond with the world outside the window. So he says, I would argue, this is Pross again, that the es essence of all scientific endeavour, stripped of its many elaborations, trimmings and jargon, is nothing more than the successful application of the inductive method. It's the successive application of the inductive method that forms the basis for what we term understanding. Inductive reasoning involves the re re reaching of general conclusions from a set of empirically obtained facts, what one might simplistically term pattern recognition. Now, I like that because pattern recognition is what makes a good expert in any field. It what makes a good bibliophile. 
or a manuscript expert, or quite probably a good paleontologist, and certainly a good doctor, and certainly a good psychiatrist. It's not ticking boxes and adding them up and uh, arriving at a diagnosis uh, by what we call the Chinese menu method. I've got two of those and three of those, and that means I've got um, Chinese meal number four. Uh, but actually, by seeing the shapes and the patterns and having seen them often enough to know what's going on. And that, in fact, is, in pattern recognition, is where logos and mythos meet. Mythos doesn't mean that it is mythical in the sense of a lie. Mythos is a way to the truth. Equally, logos is not a lie unless it steps outside its proper bounds. And one important thing for all scientific thinking and for all artistic creation is not to collapse things into a certainty too fast. If you're asked to be certain about something too early on in the process, you won't get there. Now, uh, it was mentioned that it took me 20 years to arrive at the hypothesis in the book uh, The Master and His Emissary. And that's a luxury I had because I supported myself by doing a mass of clinical work. Fortunately, I actually like patients. Uh, unlike a lot of doctors who can't wait to get into the lab. But I mean, I actually enjoy the business of seeing patients and that kept my mind working. And I managed to get free time in the library to do research. And I wasn't forced to keep publishing a paper. If I had, I'd never have been able to produce, as it were, a broader picture of things. And um, in a way, uh, part of us is asked to say, well, make up your mind. Uh, is this a duck or is it a rabbit? Um, you know, it can't be just uh, potentially a duck and potentially a rabbit at the same time. The truth about many things is not necessarily consistent. Um, those chairs look red in this light, but we could change the lighting in here and they would be green. So in one light they're green, in another light they're red. What do we mean? Are they, is it green or is it red? It has the potential to be both, it just depends on the context. And equally, for example, let's get things down to earth, safety can be very harmful. For example, protecting children from every kind of risk can stultify them in every conceivable way, both their physical and spiritual and intellectual curiosity and growth, and make them miserable if they can't be certain of everything, and make them prey to every danger when they come across it. So actually, it's irrational although we want our children to be safe, to pursue safety beyond a certain point. The problem is that logic doesn't allow us what used to be called the coincidentia oppositorum, the fact that opposites often come together. This is ancient knowledge. It's in Lao Tzu, or Lao Tzu the Chinese uh, sage that's at the heart of Taoism. It's in the philosopher Heraclitus. My three favorite philosophers begin with H. Heraclitus, Hegel, and Heidegger. Uh, but anyway, Heraclitus, um, uh, as you know, uh, for example, uh, was aware that things can change and remain the same. Uh, this was his idea that all is flux, like a river that you cannot step into twice. But the idea is in Tantric Hinduism, it's in Buddhism, it's in German mysticism, and it's in Sufism. Something can change and remain the same. A road is at the same time the road up and the road down. And the bow, which was Heraclitus's particular idea, uh, a taut string, exhibits harmonia. And what is harmonia? It is something that is pulled to both opposites at once. Not, and it exhibits, out of its tension, a third quality that grows from the string that is the string of a bow an arrow can be shot that has power to reach its target. And equally from the string of a lyre, it is possible that music will come out of this tension. It's not really there in the string itself. It's something that happens from pulling it in two directions at once. The idea is fruitful, um, and I hope uh, the hint is, is, is enough for today. And indeed, coming forward to Hegel, he said every actual thing involves its coexistence with opposed elements. Consequently, to know, or in other words, to comprehend an object, is equivalent to being conscious of it as a concrete unity of opposed determinations. So what about myths? Let's think about myths. Well, one of the great 
commentators on myth in modern times was Levi Strauss, Claude Levi Strauss, famous anthropologist. And he said, les mythes se pensent en moi. Myths think themselves in me. Rather, as Heidegger said, I don't speak language, but language speaks in me. And I think what they were both getting at is these things are not just fruits of our conscious intellect that we made up to be useful tools, but they have an existence deeper and beyond me, and that they speak to something in me that, is, that was there before I was able to think and comes out of the unconscious realm where my conscious mind can't follow. And I might point out that the Greeks who basically invented logic, also majored on myth. They were the great users of myth. And two great things that came out of Greece were the ability to think and reason logically, but the ability to understand the overwhelming power of poetry and drama. And the deal is, in other words, in myth. Because myth, in a way, is the language of metaphor. It's the language through which all art speaks, whether it be poetry or drama, or painting, or music. And we intuit, actually, the need for myth. We don't have to reason to it. We, we know it. But we can reason ourselves there by looking at the examples of people who were very good reasoners. Uh, Darwin has been much mentioned. Perhaps you know the passage in Darwin's autobiography where he says, my mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding the general laws out of large collections of facts. If I had to live my life again, I would have made a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once every week. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness and may possibly be injurious to the intellect and more probably to the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. And again, Nietzsche, who, Nietzsche is like a, like a toxin that in very small doses um, is life-giving and quickening, and in large doses um, causes intellectual death. But occasional, occasional references to Nietzsche can be deeply revealing. I'm quoting from uh, Human All Too Human, Therefore, a higher culture must give man a double brain. Two brain chambers, so to speak. One to feel science and the other to feel non-science, which can lie side by side without confusion, divisible, exclusive. This is a necessity of health. M more of that coming, as you can imagine. I hope I'm doing all right for time. Shit. OK. Um, <laughs> In fact, we become sick without it. The English philosopher um, Gregory Bateson said, mere purposive rationality unaided by such phenomena as art, religion, dream, and the like is necessarily pathogenic and destructive of life. And I wanted to um, suggest that these are really just to show you, first of all, that attention is something that we can't derive from something else. We make a leap of attention, but when we decide we're going to make a certain kind of attention to life, we find a world that corresponds to what comes forward when we pay that kind of attention. That indicates to us that the kind of attention we paid was right, and we should pay it in future, which means we get more of the same, and so a world comes into being. But if you pay a different kind of attention, you see a different world. For example, where I live on Sky, behind the house, there is a mountain um, from which uh, the place takes its name, Talisker. Um, some of you may have heard of the whiskey, which fortunately isn't made on my front door. But um, this mountain takes its name from a Norse word meaning sloping rock. Now what that indicates is that the value of this place to Norsemen was that it was a landmark. And so to them it might have been a very welcome sight on the sea. To the Picts who lived there, it was the home of the gods. To 19th century travellers who came there to paint, it was a many textured surface of colour and, and, and beauty. To people who want to mine basaltic rock, it is a, a potential source of dollars. And uh, uh, to uh, a, a geologist, it's very interesting because of its basaltic columns, but a physicist would say, 
There's nothing really there. It's just the probability of certain atoms turning up in space, and I can't be certain about that at all. Now, these are all true facts about this mountain. These are all true visions of this mountain, but I can't tell you which one is the true one. So I'm not saying there is no such thing as truth, but we need to take our net, cast our net wide. Uh, and this is really just to demonstrate how important context is. So those two orange dots are exactly the same size. What's more bizarre is that the, you had to take my word for it, but the squares A and B are in fact precisely the same colour and the same shade of colour, but because of the context, they look different, and sometimes context makes things hard to find. In fact, the dependence of meaning on context has its lighter side. Um, in America, for example, it can change the meaning of a word. They have four sizes of cereal packets, and, and the largest is called jumbo, and that means very large. And then there comes economy, which means uh, large. And then there comes family, which means medium. And finally, there is large, which means small. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, context can completely change everything. This is really just to suggest how important myths can be. This is the enactment of the myth of King Lear. Nobody has suggested that because it's a myth, it doesn't tell us true things about life. In fact, probably very few things that we've ever said or done tell us more truth about human life. Um, this is the myth of Oedipus, which helped to unravel complexities of how we relate to our parents and to our children quite important information that was hard to get another way. And this is a myth that scientists would be well to respect, the myth of Prometheus, who believed he could do everything and didn't know what it was he didn't know. Uh, as a result, um, Zeus kindly arranged for an eagle to come every day and tear out his liver, and uh, also kindly arranged that the liver would be the most self-generating organ in the body, which it actually is. So this um, uh, business is going on till this day, I believe. Um, so uh, what's this got to do with the brain? Now, I've got... God knows how. I, I'm going to try and do a very, very quick... Yeah. Yep, we're all right. We're all right, we're all right. Okay, okay, fine. Now, we all know, don't we, about... Um, the differences between the two hemispheres. You can Google it uh, uh, and uh, you get this sort of a document. The trouble is that, um, with one exception, absolutely everything on this list is wrong. <laughs> and uh, because uh, people have made such fools of themselves uh, looking at this, and because middle management seminar holders have made a speciality of talking about right and left brain, no decent self-respecting neuroscientist um, was prepared to go near the topic. So I took my life in my hands and ventured right into the lion's den and decided that it was probably irrational to suppose that uh, there was no difference between the two halves of the brain. Um, this is just uh, where you'll find the, the true story about all this. Um, uh, and people have said, oh, aren't you dichotomizing when you say the two parts of the brain um, do different things? Well, not necessarily. They might need to be distinct and yet work in unison. And there are many images that, again, are intuitive or mythological that go back um, a very long time indeed, like the Taijitu what I particularly like about this is its non-absolute uh, way in which there's a bit of yin in the yang and a bit of yang in the yin, but they go together to make up a unity, even though there is a duality within it. Now, you might say, well, that's all very well for the Chinese, but in fact, this symbol uh, has a universal uh, provenance. Here's a Saxon uh, first century AD silver plate, and this comes from a third century Roman shield. Mind you, um, probably there was traffic of ideas and symbols from the East, I, I don't say not, but it clearly meant something uh, wherever it was discovered. And take a look at that shape. Interesting, isn't it? The notion of something that is self-generating. Uh, uh, self now, there's the brain, for those of you who are not used to um, looking at them on a slab. And um, it's a, a bit of a cartoon picture, but it'll do. Um, it shows uh, the top of the brain is the front, and the bottom of the brain is, 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 is uh, bottom of the brain is the back. And the right hemisphere has been pulled aside there to show this uh, 
a band of fibers called the corpus callosum that uh, connects the two. It's not the only connection, but it's by a long way the largest one of the two, of the four or five. Um, <clears throat> But I never heard in medical school anybody ask, why is the brain divided? Uh, the question was probably too obvious, and it escaped people's attention. You see, there's a bit of a paradox here. The brain exists to make connections. In fact, that's entire power consists in connecting neuron with neuron. So on the face of it, it's a whopping great loss of computing power to have this division. And you'd have thought that over evolution we could have got rid of it but not a bit of it. In fact, it's got more over evolution in the sense that the size of the volume of the cerebral hemispheres has got larger in relation to the size of the corpus callosum over evolution, not the other way around. Um, and, uh, well, if people say it's just embryological, well, look, your skull starts off as 16 bones in utero and ends up fairly well fused um, for most of us. Uh, uh, that is really not an argument. Uh, no, and uh, the plot thickens when you realise that a lot of the traffic across the corpus callosum is actually inhibitory in nature. It, uh, there are many GABA, uh, sorry, uh, uh, glutamatergic uh, neurons that cross the uh, uh, corpus callosum and they're excitatory, but in, in uh, a, a majority of cases, in fact, they end up on GABAergic into neurons which are inhibitory and the effect is to keep the uh, hemispheres in communication with one another, but keep them distinct. And I I indeed in animals, um, it's known that um, uh, if they're not properly asymmetrical, either in their brains or in their behavior, they don't thrive. So asymmetry and difference are uh, at least as important as working together. Um, uh, now, this uh, is really just to remind me uh, to talk to you again about attention. Because in trying to work out what the difference was, I thought I'd go and look at birds and animals. And uh, fortunately, um, unlike the human neuroscientists who got in a bit of a snit um, about these middle management people, and, oh yes, that Volvo ad, the car for your right brain, they didn't like that at all. Um, but the um, animal ethologists just patiently did what scientists do. Now, never, never mind that's being put off by that. That. We'll just look at birds and animals and see what they do. And by observing them, they were able to see that they actually use their right and left hemispheres in quite different ways, quite reliably. This is unimpeachable um, in, in the sense that it has been replicated so many times and in so many species. Basically what it is, is that they need to solve a problem of survival. It's like this. You need to get food. You need to get shelter. So you need to pick up a twig to build your nest. You need to pick up a seed to eat. But to do that, suppose the seed's lying on a background of grit, you need very precise attention. Focus on what you already know is important. So you've got driven attention that goes to its goal and gets it. And that attention is narrow beam and very precisely focused. But if that's the only kind of attention you're paying, while you're getting your lunch, you become somebody else's because you need to be looking out for predators, or indeed for your mate that you might be wanting to offer food to, and so you need to know the whole picture and to understand it. Now, because I haven't got time to justify anything I'm saying, you'll just have to take a few sound bites from me. If you want to know more, there is the book to go to, <laughs> where there is an enormous amount of data, uh, I promise you, that will back me up. But effectively, the, 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 the sort of raison d'etre of the left hemisphere is utility of manipulation. It enables us to manipulate the environment. It's the bit that controls the right hand with which we uh, make tools. It's the bit that controls not all of language, but the bits of language that enable us to pin things down. So it's about precision and certainty. It's the bit that says, that's got to be a duck or it's a rabbit. I want to know now. Don't give me that guff about how it could be one or the other, you see. Um, and that's uh, sensible, because it's no good if you're out um, hunting thinking, oh God, is it a duck or is it a rabbit? I think I want rabbit today. No, you've got to just go for something and eat it. So there is a hierarchy of attention which you don't know about because when you think about how did I uh, look at something, you think, oh, I saw that bit and I saw that bit and I saw that and I added them up and got the picture. Wrong. What you did is you took the whole picture in and then you focused on some details that interested you. Um, and there is a normal hierarchy of attention which means that most people see the H and the 4 before they see the E's and the 8's. Interestingly, it, the exception to that is in schizophrenia, 
um, where there is a loss of asymmetry of the brain or sometimes a reversal of it, but in any case they can't see the whole picture. They tend to focus in on details all the time. So if you saw the E's and the 8's first, <laughs> come and see me afterwards. <laughs> No, no, look, I have a duty as a doctor to um, uh, deconcern you. There are many other possible explanations. <laughs> so, um, but for example, here, there is no way, uh, famous picture, uh, hands up everyone who's seen this before. Oh, a few of you, yes. Um, those who haven't, uh, can you see what it is? The Dalmatian dog. The Dalmatian dog, okay. So uh, if I can make the pointer work. Oh, yes, I can. There's the head. Ear dangling down, the back of the dog, tail, rear leg, front legs, path crossing in the shade of a tree. Okay? But there is actually nowhere, no possible way in hell that you can go to that and say it's part of a shadow and go to that and say it's part of a dog and you build it up from the bits. You don't. There's an aha moment and that is actually a dramatic instance of what we do all the time. So actually the whole is different from the sum of the parts and uh, that it's not just made up out of the parts. And um, this has something to do with the right hemisphere, which is aware of the whole picture, where the left hemisphere is focusing on parts and puts things together from bits. And when people have problems with their right hemisphere, they know the parts, but not the whole. They've lost what we call the gestalt. There's probably a word in Dutch that's very similar to that, I imagine. Um, so this is a man, you see. Well, he's got a, you know, thorax and abdomen, and he's got at least three out of the four limbs, but it's not recognisable. This is a bicycle where the wheels um, uh, and the pedals are there, but they're in the wrong relationship, uh, and they are the wrong size in relation to one another. And here's a house which one recognises because it's got one of those things uh, on top of it and uh, very little else that uh, makes sense. So these are put together from the bits. And, you know, you ask somebody to draw an elephant, and with their left hemisphere they draw a trunk, and then they draw an ear, and then they draw a foot. And then, but they can't draw the elephant, so it's interesting. Um, and in one, uh, if we had to sort of, I, I, I'm going to have to be very quick and dirty, but if one had to sort of say, what is it that differentiates the sort of world that the very focused piecemeal attention of the left hemisphere comes to create, and the sort of broad, open, non-committed attention of the right hemisphere comes to make, the differences are more or less these, that one understands that a whole is not just the sum of the parts. Uh, putting the parts together misses a lot. Putting half a cow uh, with another half of a cow doesn't necessarily give you a cow. Um, it also um, looks for certainty, whereas it's narrowing down all the time to a certainty. Remember, it's got to get things, whereas the right hemisphere, as Ramachandran calls it, is the devil's advocate, Diabolus, uh, advocatus diaboli. So it's the one that is um, on the lookout for things being not quite fitting categories. So it's much more interested in uniqueness. Um, it's much more in contact with the actual experience, which is not pre-digested into one of those, one of those, one of those, one of those, putting it into pigeonholes. Um, and so you could say the left is narrowing down to certainty and the right opening up to possibility. One other difference is between fixity and flow. So, in fact, everything in the universe depends on this. Um, there needs to be forces for stasis and forces for flow. And it's true of atoms, it's true of cells, it's true of plants and animals, it's true of thinking processes. One needs to get both working together, so we need both. Um, and the problem is that uh, sometimes um, the, the right hemisphere can appreciate flow, so it's the one that really gives us our sense of time and our sense of music, which unfolds through time as a flowing thing. Um, the, the left hemisphere is better at points. Uh, it sees it in a way as a, as a, as a shuddering cine film creates the illusion of flow, uh, or as digital media create the, the illusion of a unity. And if you have damage to the right parieto occipital region, you can sometimes get this effect of trails, uh, which you can also get with psychedelic substances, um, which are harming your right parieto occipital region. Um, another is the difference that I said before uh, between um, the explicit uh, 
uh, sorry, I'm going to go back because that's a bit distracting. Um, between, on the one hand, the, the detail that's taken out of context and uh, put into a category which is also decontextualised. So the things that are made explicit, it's one of those, I know where to put it, compared with the right hemisphere's um, better uh, appreciation of the thing before we have uh, clocked it as something familiar and made it, if you like, almost already an icon or image of itself. And Elkin and Goldberg, very distinguished American neuroscientist who many of you will know about, um, spent most of his working life demonstrating this point that when things are new and it doesn't matter uh, what kind of newness that is um, it might be a new uh, idea or a new shape or a new colour or a new word or whatever but they, they come to you uh, first in the right hemisphere and are more processed by the right hemisphere until they become familiar and then it moves over to the left so it's like the left is the world of representation where the left is the world of Presencing, And once again, English doesn't have the right word for this. Um, I'm taking the word presencing. It's not a verb in English, to presence. Uh, to be present is not quite the same either. It's a, it's a, it's a Heideggerism, for which, again, I, I apologise, probably in Dutch there's a useful word. So, um, in the one you've got, as it were, the territory, the right hemisphere, and in the left you've got the map. In the right you've got appreciation of uniqueness. In the left, the categories. Um, I'd have to finesse that because, of course, both of them do have categories, but they're interestingly based on different principles. So there you go. So in the one, you've got a world in which there are lots of parts that are relatively fixed and certain, that are explicit, clearly members of categories, that can be quantified, and that are, as it were, already familiar and represented. In the other, you've got a world in which everything is connected to everything else because it's all part of a flow, in which there's only holes, not parts, or at least there are parts, but they're approximate regions of holes, in which things are possible, everything is potential, um, in which the everything is actually best implicit and changes its nature when it's put in the spotlight of attention, like sex and religion. Um, and and where there are unique things, not just categorised things, where the qualities, the howness of things, how is it done, is as important as what is done. Uh, and you have those two worlds, and we need them both, and we need them fused in consciousness. Now, I'm just going to... That's all rather abstract, so I'm going to run through some uh, nice-looking slides. <clears throat> this one is something that medics will know uh, immediately which demonstrates that following a right hemisphere stroke, the world is constituted only by the left hemisphere, and although there's no blindness involved, you get only half the world, the bit that the left hemisphere is interested in manipulating. It can't be bothered with that stuff. It knows that the bits it uses are on the right. Uh, and so you just get... A right, if you ask people to copy things, they will just copy the right side. And if you uh, attend... If you're standing in their left a visual field, you, you won't be attended to. You have to stand over on the right. Not because they're blind. It's an attentional problem. And they'd read only the right page of a newspaper and sometimes only clothe or shave the right part of the body, not the left. So reality is brought into being on one side. Now, if you have a, a stroke in the left hemisphere so that the right hemisphere is constituting the world, you don't just get a half world because it's interested in the whole picture and it's the one which is on the lookout. So it has this broad, um, vigilant, sustained kind of attention that is enough to create a whole world. Now, these are interesting. These come from experiments in which people had one hemisphere at a time inactivated. So on the left... Um, you get a tree drawn by um, a person in the normal state. This is their tree by the left hemisphere, which interestingly shows just information on the right. But that's not what I'm interested in here. It's how withered and symbolic this tree has become in relation to anything you'd recognise, whereas the right hemisphere's tree has the sort of flow and form of life. Here the same thing has happened to flowers, where in the left hemisphere version they've become geometric simplified objects whereas the right hemispheres have the structure of a living thing. And this is really just to show that only the right hemisphere sees depth. It sees things in the world, in, in, in a deep world, not just a two-dimensional representation um, in the way the left hemisphere gives you um, uh, a, a kind of map of the world. And these are all by the left hemisphere. And uh, so you see the flattening out that happens, and you see what a man or person gets re re reduced to there, 
a rather sad um, <laughs> symbol of a human being. Uh, and, and just uh, uh, to take from Gazaniga and Ledoux, this is interesting. This is a, before the operation of commissurotomy. This was what Sperry and Bogan uh, pioneered in California in the uh, uh, um, 60s uh, and at Caltech, uh, which was an operation to help people with intractable epilepsy where they divided the corpus callosum. And pre-op, you can see that the left and right hands can both do a passable cube. But after the operation on the bottom here, you can see that the right hand can no longer draw a cube because it's only in touch with the left hemisphere. The divide that would have enabled information from the right hemisphere to get to the right hand has gone. So it just draws a child's cube. <coughs> Whereas the left hand has not done a very beautiful cube, but for post-op it's not bad. At least it shows you the depth. So that is... Uh, uh, some idea about it. Uh, another aspect of the left hemisphere is its denial, which is quite amazing. You can see a patient who's had a stroke and it's affected the left side of their body, and this is not unusual. This happens in the majority of cases. So any of you that are doctors or medical students will have seen this. You go on the ward after the patients come in with a right hemisphere stroke, and you see them in the ward round in the morning. You say, how are you? I I'm very well, thank you. Oh, good. Um, any problems? No, no. Uh, specifically, any problems moving your left arm? No, no, no. Uh, let me see it then. There. Well, I didn't see anything. Did you see anything? No, no, no. So you bring it right round in front of the person and say, there, move that. They go, oh, that? Oh, that's not my arm. That belongs to the bloke in the next bed. And these are people who are not psychotic. They just have no concept that they're uh, unable in some way. And um, people who have right hemisphere strokes underestimate their disability and are therefore harder to rehabilitate than people with a left hemisphere stroke, which is interesting because you'd think that, you know, left hemisphere stroke, can't speak, can't use the right hand. For most of us, that's pretty disabling. But actually, it's easier to get them back to work than it is somebody with a right hemisphere stroke because they don't understand the world. They don't understand what people are meaning. Anything that's implicit, like body language, facial language, tone of voice, humour, irony, metaphor, doesn't understand it. And, and also, they don't know how limited they are. So they're in a different world. Now, uh, so this is really to illustrate the kinds of attention of the right hemisphere governing, sorry, the left hemisphere governing the right hand and going straight for its target. Um, but if you like, uh, that is the way uh, the left hemisphere thinks, and it's actually, for all our sophistication, at the bottom of many of our models, a Newtonian mechanical idea of how systems work, which has been lethal in finance, lethal in biology, uh, in the understanding of a human being, and lethal uh, in general when applied to life, because in fact, um, life is complex, and systems are self-referring. For example, if you predict the stock market, you've already changed the stock market in which you, on which you were basing the prediction. Equally, if I tell you about some wonderful unspoilt island in Greece that only I know about, um, it's suddenly spoilt. So this is, this is a problem. Whereas the right hemisphere, so I down here at the bottom, because the only way I could make it fit on the slide, um, sees uh, that things are interconnected. There isn't just A to B, but A to just about anything else, and it's living. So various studies have shown that the left hemisphere codes preferentially for tools and machines, even in left-handers who are actually using um, the right part of uh, their brain to control uh, their left hand and tools and machines, uh, whereas the uh, right hemisphere is more interested in the animate. Now, this is just to remind me to talk to you very quickly about the fact that things have changed over time. Um, at times in cultures, I'm not suggesting that the brain changes, but I'm suggesting that the way we use the brain changes. So they each offer us different ways of thinking. And normally this is below consciousness. You're not aware that you're alternating the version of the world that the right hemisphere gives and the version of the world that the left hemisphere gives. Because if you were, you wouldn't be able to move. You wouldn't be able to do anything. So we're shielded from the knowledge in consciousness. Which is why when people say there's nothing we can know about ourselves that we couldn't know without brain science, I think they're very much on the track of truth because there's lots of nonsense talked about what the brain can reveal. But this is one thing the brain can reveal that we wouldn't otherwise know. It's revealed by clever experiments and by natural experiments such as stroke and tumour. We know that they do different, they give us different worlds. <coughs> 
And when we stop and reflect on reality, we have to choose one or the other, because otherwise we're inconsistent. And in the past, we were able to be inconsistent because we realized there was a coincidentia oppositorum. Wise people knew that things weren't cut and dried, that not all truths were compatible, that not everything that's important can be made explicit, that metaphors and myths are good ways to truth. But since the Enlightenment, we have come to a view that only one kind of logical, self-coherent picture is compatible with truth, and that is the biggest error that you can make on the path to truth. So, um, looking back through the ages, uh, in the book I start in the ancient Greek world, and I move through the Roman world and forward to the Renaissance, and what I think I show is that three times we can see a picture of a society emerging in which everything that the right and the left hemisphere give when they're working together causes a brilliant explosion of valuable and original work in science and in the arts. It's not a science-arts split because for both science and for the arts you need both the left and the right, okay? For imagination you need both and imagination is at the root of good science and it's at the root of good art. So you can see that happen and each time you see over the centuries it drift away into the decay of a civilization as it becomes more enthralled to the explicit material mechanistic view of the left hemisphere. This happens between the 6th century and about the 4th century and certainly 3rd century uh, BC in Greece. And then it happens again in Rome with a wonderful period at the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Augustan era, an era of about 100 years in which everything that we thank the Romans for, for their wonderful poetry, um, their codification of laws, the invention of sanitation, um, everything that they contributed to uh, civilization, including um, perspective in art. Yes, it wasn't just invented in Florence in the 15th century. The Greeks had it and the Romans had it, but in every case we lost it as civilization decayed it fell away with the Roman Empire. And as an image of that, you can think how those great walls that made of concrete that made the Roman Empire possible were filled with the bric-a-brac of beautifully proportioned temples just thrown in to make size matter where proportion used to be important. And the same thing happens here, where uh, in the medieval world, we don't paint what we can see, we paint what we know by theory to be the case. So actually we know that this chap is not really um, ten times larger than this chap, but he's ten times more important, so he gets more space in the picture. And we know that this is impossible perspective, but we weren't able to record what we actually saw. And if you come forward only um, 150 years, you see this wonderful uh, nativity by Ghirlandaio, in which the concept of people connected in time and space is imaged in the landscape, in that procession, um, and you can go back in space um, uh, deeply there. Uh, there's a huge depth of space in into which we're drawn to explore, and there's a huge depth of time here. This is set back 1,500 years earlier, as the Roman sarcophagus indicates, but it's also true now, as the contemporary Florentine dress of the shepherds tells us. And this is just an excuse to show you a very beautiful painting, which is my favourite painting by Claude in the Ashmolean in Oxford. And here there is a myth, the myth of Ascanius and the stag, but it's not really about that kind of myth. It's about how we relate to the world. There are five planes of depth out of this almost abstract painting of beauty, of texture and form. And already this temple has thousands of years of age on it, uh, although it's set 2,000 years or 1,600 years or whatever it was uh, prior to that. We're nearing the end, don't worry. Um, and this is in the modern era. Um, where we see reality as a construct which is painted onto the windows and unfortunately if you open the windows you'll find nothing there. Well, what would happen if, as I think, we've come to view the world only in terms of the left hemisphere? I think what's happened is we've, we've, we've said no to the intuitions that come through myth, through art, through spirituality, um, through our, the, 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 what are thought of as the truths of our culture. Um, we've, we've said no to them. We've said, no, we know better. It doesn't matter that people since time began have always thought in a certain way, we are the clever ones. Well, we might just be the first really dumb ones who don't know how to look after the world, who are in the process of destroying it. 
Now, if I was right that we were just using the left hemisphere to image the world, what would it look like? It would look a bit like this. There would be the loss of the broader picture. Knowledge would become replaced simply by information or by the tokens or representations of information, um, spreadsheets, um, sheets with boxes that need to be ticked, and algorithms. I mean, of course, they haven't been invented yet, but if those things were, that's what the left hemisphere world would look like. I'm sure you've never had to fill in a tick box. There would be the loss of the concepts of skill and judgment, because they're too human. It would be replaced by something a computer could carry out. Oops, hello. Um, there would be simultaneous loss of um, the embodiment uh, that means that things are neither abstract nor fully reified. On the one hand, there would just be lump and matter, which is resource to be exploited, and everything else would be cerebralized, and we would be treated as though we were brains in a vat. <coughs> Peter Berger, famous sociologist, wrote about bureaucracy, that it was characterised by these elements, all of which would have a field day, because these are the typical ways of thinking of the left hemisphere. Explicit procedures, anonymity, organisability, predictability, justice reduced to mere equality, and explicit abstraction. There'd be loss of the sense of uniqueness, replaced always by categories. Quantity would become the only criterion, not quality, and things would become black and white, either or, not a matter of shades of meaning. Reasonableness will be replaced by rationality. In German, there are the two concepts of Verstand and Vernunft. And again, I hope in Dutch you have this. In English, we don't. We just have reason, but we can say rationality. And by reason, I mean balancing of logic with intuition born of experience. What used to be thought of as the main purpose of a human life, to become an intelligent, wise person. There'd be a failure of common sense, which is by no means common these days. Um, systems would be designed to maximise utility. There'd be a loss of social cohesion because empathy comes from the right hemisphere. There'd be depersonalization. There'd be a paranoia and lack of trust because the left hemisphere wants to control things in its own interest. It's the one that manipulates. And it's very unhappy when people do things that it can't codify and control. So there'd be CCTV cameras all over the place and DNA data banks and so forth. There'd be a need, in fact, for total control. And people think the left hemisphere is the one without emotion. It's the right hemisphere that deals with emotion. But as I said, all these generalizations are untrue. The left hemisphere is actually the one to which anger most lateralizes. And that's one of the most lateralized of all emotions. It lateralizes to the left. And we would see ourselves as the passive victims of others doing, not taking responsibility for a world which had reverberative consequences. Art would become purely conceptual. Visual art would lack the sense of depth which the right hemisphere comes. Interestingly, depth in space, like harmony and music, came with the Renaissance and disappeared with the 20th century. And there'd be only distorted or bizarre perspectives. Music would be reduced to little more than rhythm, which is the bit of music that the left hemisphere does get. And uh, language would become, I hope not too much like mine, diffuse, excessive, and lacking in concrete reference. Very, very abstract. There'd be a deliberate undercutting of the sense of awe or wonder. Uh, this is the age of wonder I'm supposed to be talking to you about. But things like wonder and awe irritate the hell out of the left hemisphere, which knows it can understand everything. It doesn't really like this kind of concept. It seems like an affront to its intelligence. Flow would be reduced to just an infinite series of pieces. We'd have to discard all tacit forms of knowing and would become, as de Tocqueville predicted in America in the 1830s, uh, overwhelmed by a network of small complicated rules. We'd be rather spectators than actors in the world. And all of this would be accompanied by a dangerously unwarranted optimism. Well, if that rings any bells, it, it, it might be because we are shifting towards a rigid way of thinking that characterises just one half of the brain, the half that doesn't see very much. I'm winding up here. I'm just saying, sometimes we think we can make things happen. Sometimes, according to the left hemisphere, we make things happen by building them up from pieces. So I have this fact, which I know is true, and I put it down and I build another. This is the way, in fact, in which you build walls. But it's not the way in which you make a painting or a sculpture or a piece of music or a poem or a society. In fact, we clear things away. And it became obvious to me as a literary critic that what my task was not to put clever things in front of the work of art between you and it, but to get out of the way as much as possible and to clear the nonsense that was talked so that you could actually see it afresh for the first time. This statue, one of the last works of Michelangelo, shows a prisoner coming out of the rock. And I think it's a wonderful and moving image of creation. 
as a clearing away of something that's already there, not the putting together of something that our conscious mind can know. And finally, don't be deceived into thinking the world is just at heart a matter of utility. It isn't. There was a lovely series on British radio by a man who was the curator of the British Museum, Neil McGregor, called The History of the World in a Hundred Objects. I imagine it might even have been exported. It was very good. And in it he said, right away, looking way back in time, to prehistoric times, I was absolutely amazed to see that the first human artefacts are as much about beauty and complexity as they are about utility. And that old lie that beauty and complexity are only for those of us who have affluence is absolutely untrue. In fact, we've made our society more ugly than people who often, in their poverty, as we think, have a wealth of spirit that comes out in their art. Thank you. Do you know uh, Ken Wilber? Yeah. And um, it reminds me a little bit, or it strikes me, um, that um, Ken Wilber guy, who is like a master of uh, defining all the sectors and really trying to get the big picture, is actually uh, building up kind of a, a left brain <laughs> thing. Yeah. Look, um, some people say, Your work is incredibly thorough, it's very logical, and it's based on a mass of scientific evidence. It's a bit left-brained, isn't it? Well, I'd like to say, my point is not that the right hemisphere is always right and the left hemisphere wrong. Uh, my problem is that they need to work together. And the left hemisphere thinks it can go it alone. That's my only problem with it. And that's what the, the image of the master and his emissary um, is about. It's a little hint taken from Nietzsche about a wise spiritual master who looked after a community so well that it flourished and he realized that he couldn't look after it, all its needs himself but he actually also realized something more important which was that he shouldn't try to because if he was involved in all that he couldn't see the big picture so he delegated his brightest and best to go about being his emissary and doing the work but that master although he was very bright sorry the emissary although he was very bright didn't know what the master knew and so he thought he knew everything And he pretended to be the master wherever he went, because he thought, I'm doing all the heavy lifting here. That chap's just sitting on his backside, smiling seraphically. But because he thought he knew everything, he, the, everything became ruined. The, 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 the community fell into, uh, into disarray. And really, this is the story of the, of the um, Sorcerer's Apprentice, and it's the story of Prometheus, and it's the problem with the left hemisphere. It thinks it knows everything, but it doesn't. So I'm complimented if it seems to bring the left and the right together. If it was just a work of the left hemisphere, it wouldn't have a broad vision. But I've got to build bridges between the two camps in this world of those who think with their left hemisphere and those who think with their right. And the only way to do that is to present something that even someone with very left hemisphere way of thinking can understand. And people write to me saying things like, Thank you for your book. All my life I realize I've been thinking just using my left hemisphere, but now I understand what everyone else is doing. And my marriage has improved, and my job has improved. <laughs> Thinking, yeah, well, I, I got through. So, yeah. Well, Ian... Stunned I, you all in I, place. Yeah, I, <laughs> I guess you just overwhelmed us with so much information and knowledge that we maybe uh, 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 have to thank you right now. Last chance? No? Okay, thanks a lot. Thank thanks you. a lot. Thank you very much.